In July 2008, I asked Australian activists about their successful climate change strategies. I quickly learned that, at the grassroots level, Australians aren't exactly talking about climate change. Instead, they're focused on caring for climate refugees, working in solidarity with indigenous groups, and building sustainable communities. In short, they're creating climate justice. The industrialized nations know that carbon taxes and markets will not end the real problems of overconsumption and global inequality. But it seems an even greater challenge to develop the processes and local leaders who can find the right solutions for each community. Yet, Australian activists are already doing this, from Barrington to Newcastle, the largest coal port in the world. When I asked how people of industrialized nations could advocate for climate justice, this is what I learned. Fossil fuels power lifestyles that we in the industrialized nations take for granted. Burning fossil fuels produces gases, including carbon dioxide, which overload the natural greenhouse gas effect. After decades of debate and denial, the picture is now clear. We in the industrialized nations are changing the climate. The Earth's temperature is finely regulated by gases in the atmosphere. Their presence keeps the surface of the planet warm enough to sustain life. Every year, human-emitted greenhouse gases are trapping more heat close to the surface of the planet. On a large scale, this is influencing global weather patterns and ocean currents. The Greenland and Antarctic ice caps have begun to melt, putting coastal cities and agriculture under threat of catastrophic flooding. The countries that are polluting the most need to make the biggest changes. These include Canada, Australia, and the United States, the three worst per capita emitters in the world. I looked for leaders who were challenging the status quo and found them at the annual meeting of Friends of the Earth in Barrington Tops, New South Wales. Friends of the Earth demonstrate risk leadership by confronting mainstream ideas of organizing with a revolutionary vision, but they also try not to take themselves too seriously. <laughs> People can choose whether they do this or this. <laughs> so at the community level, we place a lot of emphasis on engaging with other constituencies, breaking outside the, the traditional environmental movement ghetto, I guess, in terms of class and, and, and race. Um, so that is a great influence on who we work with and who we seek to work with. We put a lot of emphasis into non-hierarchical structures, into collaborative and participatory decision making, and into empowerment of activists. And then I think that flows through into how we then work with other constituencies, other groups, other sectors. So in terms of um, starting work from a grassroots perspective on climate justice, I think there's a couple of things that people need to do. The first one is always to be resolutely internationalist in your approach because uh, across North America, in Europe, in Australia, often the, the, the debate, even where it has traction around climate change, it's still very domestic in focus and it forgets that the global north is such radical over emitters of greenhouse gases. So you've got to be internationalist. You've always got to put it into the context of what do we need to do as historical and contemporary over emitters and that needs to influence the, the depth of the cuts uh, we need to achieve locally. Um, I see climate justice as a way to build community because all the things we need, sustainable food, sustainable transport, livable cities, uh, thriving ecosystems are all imperatives under climate justice. So I see climate justice as a lens through which we can look at this other work, relocalisation of food and you know, rebuilding of transport systems and that type of thing. So I see it as an option to, to create programs for deeper change rather than short term change. And but also spend the time to develop a vision for where they want to be in the longer term. So what's the vision of a sustainable future? And then work backwards and say, okay, at this point in our neighbourhood, in our state, in our province, what are the what are the big problems? Is it coal? Is it land clearance? You know, is it is it transport systems? And work locally and work incrementally on those issues, but always hold, hold the long term vision of where you want to be. Um, three years ago, we had the first walk against warming in Australia, which was on the International Day of Action against um, on climate change. And so in Australia, we called it the Walk Against Warming, and there were rallies in cities all around Australia. On our national campaign for the last few years, one of our sort of key areas that we've been working on is the issue of climate refugees. 
and working to get recognition for climate refugees within Australia as well as get the Australian Government to take responsibility for providing funding for people who need to relocate within the Pacific um, as a result of uh, climate change impacts. I think it's really important to listen to what grassroots organisations in the majority world are saying um, because these are the people who are least responsible for climate change and yet are bearing the brunt. So for us to be informed by what those movements and organisations are saying is really key to achieving climate justice. And um, I guess in terms of the social movement, I definitely think, you know, it needs to be participatory and everyone it should you know, be able to have their voice, but movements need to be diverse. You're never going to get everyone agreeing on everything. Um, and I think you have to allow space for that. So not expect that everything, that everyone will agree, because they won't. <laughs> <laughs>